Hello, good afternoon, and you're very welcome to another episode of Land of the Rising Scrum here on Off the Ball. This is episode 14, and for those of you doing the maths now, we have six more teams to cover and just four weeks to get them all in. So this week we are going to double up. We're going to look at two countries, one from Pool C and one from Pool D. In a short while, former Fiji captain Atani Talai is going to join me on the line. But first, though, we're going to focus on the USA this afternoon. World Cup regulars at this stage, they've played in all but one tournament, missing the 1995 tournament in South Africa. And despite being World Cup regulars, though, they've only won three times before at the tournament. The last of those coming in 2011 against Russia. Four years ago in 2015, they found themselves in a desperately tough pool alongside South Africa, Scotland, Japan and Samoa and lost all four games and it was quite disappointing as well, scored just four, five tries. But 2019 looks like being another tough pool, England, Argentina, France, Tonga for the USA and uh, this uh, last World Cup cycle though, it has seen some improvements. Last year's win against Scotland was the standout. And what we are going to focus on today is there is a strong Irish connection to the current group. Uh, former Irish women's coach Greg McWilliams is there as an attack coach. And of the group that is just recently back from Fiji at the Pacific Nations Cup, three are Irish born, John Quill, Dylan Fawcett and Paul Mullen. And there's also a fourth, Paddy Ryan, born in Chicago, but he did grow up in Cork and came through the uh, Munster school system. One of those wild geese, though, is on the line right now to speak to me. 35 caps for the United States and hopefully heading to his second World Cup soon in the next few weeks. John Quayle, live in New York. Thanks for speaking to us this afternoon. No problem, Neil. How are things? Not too bad. It looks absolutely fantastic where you are at the moment. Uh, you're New York-based. Yeah. Looks like an, a, an absolutely beautiful day. I've been told you've been, been out enjoying yourself so far this afternoon. Yeah, I just got a little bit of a surfing this morning just to get the body uh, a bit more relaxed to back into training this week so it's nice to have a, have a bit of a change there yeah i was speaking to you earlier in the week and you were saying you're kind of you've a few days off before you head back into into camp in colorado after after the pacific nations cup uh colorado is where you're going the high performance center but at the moment back home in new york like wh what are you doing at the moment getting ready is this a down week or are you kind of doing your own training well no last week was a it was a down week we, get, we were actually lucky enough we got two weeks off we were into camp pretty early after the season, um, so we got two weeks off on the back of the PNC there. Uh, so last week, just chilled, got to see family, and uh, this week, getting back into it, uh, ramping it back up to head back to the mountains, uh, back to the altitude to uh, more fitness testing and all that fun stuff. Yeah, and Colorado, that's where the, is that where like the USA Rugby, their kind of high performance center, their, their main training center is based, where you go for all your camps? It has been uh, more recently, yeah. Since Gary Gold uh, got involved, he kind of wanted to centralise it a little bit. We were bouncing around the country an awful lot. Travel here is, is crazy at the best of times. Um, so he's kind of kind of picked Colorado to be it, and uh, he's went to the highest point of it uh, in uh, Colorado Springs to the uh, Air Force Academy there. So uh, that's where we're getting a lot the bulk of our work done this summer. And I suppose the altitude then, that just makes those training camps even tougher than they normally would be. Yeah, the air is fairly rare up there, to be honest. Yeah, it's like breathing through a straw. But uh, no, it's it's been standing to us though. We since we we got out of the altitude uh, to Fiji and stuff like that, it makes life an awful lot easier in terms of fitness. And how long has that uh, that centre been in place? You were saying you kind of bounced around the places. Where, what kind of locations would you have been going to? And I suppose as well at the same time, they probably wouldn't have been rugby specific centres, would they? No, absolutely not. Um, I mean, in terms of camps for us, it, it, a lot of times it's you're in, you're just released from your club, you're in and you're playing that week. Um, so you don't get much of a camp. It's it's only these long stretches of World Cup preps that we actually get together and see each other for more than uh, four weeks at a time usually. So um, the last World Cup, uh, we were in New York for a bit. We were in Philadelphia. We played an awful lot more games in the run-up to the last one. Uh, whereas this time we had our PNC um, and we just have Canada left before the World Cup, um, so it's just it's a lot it's a lot more um, fitness focused and kind of getting our cohesion rather than getting game time. Yeah, you mentioned the PNC there. I'll I'll chat a bit about that a little bit later on, but I want to start on your own background because uh, born and raised in Cork in uh, Yall, would have been involved with Munster at underage level. Uh, can you tell me your own story, kind of how I suppose, even way back, how you started out in rugby, and then to the point of getting where you are now, ending up in the United States? Sure, yeah. Um, as you said, I Cork, born and raised um, down in Yall. I uh, would have played my youth rugby there. 
and then eventually moved up to Cork and played with uh, Dolphin while I was in the Munster Sub Academy. Uh, I was in there uh, for about three years. Um, unfortunately, didn't get a contract in 2012 uh, when I finished my Sub Academy time. Uh, I was pretty competitive with the likes of uh, Peter Romani, Tommy O'Donnell and, and those boys. So, uh, fortunately, I missed out. Um, and that's when I came over to the US first. I uh, moved over to Boston in 2012 with my now wife. Um, and I, I tried to get in just before the 2011 World Cup um, when Eddie was there. Uh, but just missed out on that. I uh, just came in for a camp and was back out again. Um, but in 2012, I got into the system. Um, I got my first cap in November of that year. Um, and since then, it's, yeah, I've been bouncing from pillar to post. I was uh, I was in London with London uh, Welsh for a year. Um, we got promoted to the Premiership. Um, and then I was in Sacramento when they started the professional rugby over here. Denver for two years and I've been in New York for the last year um, so it's yeah it's been a, an eventful career uh, it kind of took a turn in 2012 but it turned out to be for the good and uh, uh, yeah it's been it's been great and the move to the initial move over to Boston in 2012 was that kind of was part of that motivated by the fact that you knew there was the opportunity to play for the USA? We're not talking about residency rules or anything, because uh, is it your mother, I think, was born in the States, so you, you were qualified to play, and yeah. as you hinted, you'd kind of looked at the possibility around 2010 or 11 of, of getting in with, uh, with Eddie O'Sullivan. So um, when you were going over there in 2012, were you thinking this, this could be a long-term, a long-term stay? Uh, to be honest, no. It, it was actually... Uh um because once i didn't get in in 2011 and then and then not getting the contract in 2012 break from rugby it's it's a very intense environment um being in those academies uh, especially trying to juggle it with a college i just finished college in 2012 as well so it was it was actually an opportunity to take a break take a step back from it all um and reassess um and i think i was in the country two days um and i was calling to a camp uh, so funny how it works out that way and uh kind of haven't looked back since um it's been a fantastic journey and gee, an awful lot of and when you were back in in ireland as well as you said played a bit of uh, ail rugby with dolphin as well there were like there's a solid Dolphin core even around at the moment, like, you know, you have the Scallon, Scannell brothers, James Cronin as well. Would you have yeah. played in that kind of, uh, alongside any of them with yeah, Dolphin? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, James, he was the same year as me, as well as Paddy Ryan, who's, who's now an Eagle as well. Um, so, yeah, it was uh, it was a very competitive year. We had a quality team at the time. It's, uh, disappointing to hear how Dolphin have gone since. Um, with... Uh, we're dropping a couple of divisions because it's a great club. But, uh, yeah, no, Dave O'Callaghan, uh, who's just after moving to Biarritz, who's a good friend of mine, would have been the same year as well. So, yeah, no, there's, uh, there's definitely a lot of contacts uh, around. When you, when you did finish up with Munster in the academy, uh, like, was there a determination to kind of keep your rugby journey going? Because, as you said, you've, you've been all around the place, obviously going over to the States, then back over to playing a bit with London Irish, London Welsh as well. Sacramento yeah. all over the United States like you seem like you're open to any any adventure possible yeah it, it was that um, to be honest because for a while um, just before we came over to Sacramento I'd been bouncing around as you said to a few different clubs in the UK um, and then the opportunity to come over here came up and kind of my missus turned to me and she's like well I, I could do with the US for a little while I've been chasing you for a bit. Now you can kind of go where I want to go. <laughs> um, so it, it worked out that we could come here and see a little bit of this lifestyle, which has been fantastic. Um, so, yeah, it, I mean, once I, I, I'm not sure which point it was, but it, it came to a, a point where it was like, all right, it's time to start using rugby to benefit me rather than it kind of using me a little bit, which it can do for a lot of guys. So, um, yeah, I was lucky enough that I had the passport and, and was able to come over here. Would you have been over and back a lot uh, to the States when you were younger as well? 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, my mom would have been visiting. We a lot of our, my mom's side of the family are on the East Coast in Philadelphia and New Jersey and stuff. She has uh, four brothers and a sister, so uh, five brothers and sisters. So a lot of aunts and uncles I've been able to see a lot more of um, this season, which I hadn't been able to see in a long time. So that's that was nice. On the international front, um, I mentioned 2015 in the intro there and how it was quite a disappointing World Cup uh, for the USA. You actually retired after that. Such was the frustration with the way things were going yeah. and the way they seemed to be going down the line. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, there was a lot of frustration because we actually we had a quality squad. and We didn't perform to the quality of that squad, which is the most frustrating thing. Um, I, there was a changes in staff after the World Cup um, which was what kind of they, they reached out to me uh, only about a year out at, once I retired I kind of just said I wanted to kind of do the club thing and uh, and not have to travel with, with the US for a little while just because of those frustrations um, but I mean it's night and day now um, the standard of coaching the professionalism it, it it, it feels like it was 10 years ago rather than just three and a half. Um, so, yeah, no, it, it, there was a lot of frustrations around it and then the results. So uh, we've changed it. Some upsets like we have, uh, as you mentioned, uh, last summer. Um, so, yeah, that's the plan going into this one, yeah. And um, like, what was it that brought you back? You said that kind of the the plans had changed, the long term plans had changed, with the way the coaching went. Could you see it immediately that you know this is, this actually was going to be a new dawn? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was actually playing with Sacramento, and um, the boys were in town. They they had a game uh, in Sacramento, and uh, uh, John Mitchell at the time asked me just to come in and help out uh, a little bit um, for the, the week that they were there and I could see it was a very very different to, to how I remembered it um, so in the end it was an easy decision to get back involved uh, John did a great work for us and kind of made, made us a step in a, the right direction and, and Gary's picked it up from there and, and, and really kicked on from it um, so yeah and what has changed? Like, you know, what, what have you done on the pitch even uh, to the point where last year you were able to go out and beat Scotland, for example? Just, I mean, I, I feel like the biggest thing for us is we're training smarter. Um, we're not on the pitch for the sake of being on the pitch. Uh, we're listening to guys' bodies. We're using GPS smarter. Um, we've uh, you Bevan in now as strength and conditioning coach. Um, and... He's a wealth of experience and knowledge that we're really using to our benefit so that we're, we're fitter, we're, we feel ourselves one of the fittest teams that, that we come up against. We played against Japan a couple of weeks ago and they're known for their high intensity and their fitness and we were, we were able to stand up to that for the most part, um, fitness-wise at least. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's those things and then the management side of it, they're looking after our hotels are a little bit better and stuff like that guys are actually getting paid a little bit more stuff like that whereas before it was kind of this is what we've done and this is what we always do kind of thing we're not taking that for granted you just change and, and improve and tour to tour and do those little things kind of make a, a massive difference even just kind of like the the standard of the footballs at training or the standard of the you know the, the gear you'll be given to, to wear on the training pitch and the, the quality of the hotels, those little bits that kind of make you realise, okay, they actually are investing a little bit more into us and you know, maybe we can get a oh. bit more out of that. Oh absolutely, one hundred percent. And we we finally now have a players union, so we have a voice, um, which we didn't for a long time. We just had to kind of put up and put up with whatever was coming our way, but now we were able to put our voice forward and uh, as you said like just little bits and pieces with better tackle suits or we had like something dolphin probably would have used 20 years ago the last World Cup whereas now we have proper suits and guys bodies are looked after we have more staff more medical staff travel with us um so it, yeah there's a lot of stuff that up and, and then we try to have to 
probably the other half leave. Um, here, now it's okay. What we need to do next time, work. Uh, so you know, we're definitely taking steps in the right direction. And with the with the new league here, guys expect a little bit more as well. They're all professional players now as well, so they know what to expect. John, I might just get you to move ever so slightly. Maybe I think the the line was dropping out there in bits and pieces. Okay. Okay. The um. So yeah, I'm going to mention the. Uh, as I said, there are a lot of Irish guys in the squad. I'm going to get to those guys in a minute uh, because it's a nice thing to be able to talk about having so many Irish-born players, you know, expanding their horizons and you know taking advantage of Irish re- or American relatives and stuff to to go and chase their dreams of rugby. But um, in terms of the actual American-born players, like where are these players coming from? What are their backgrounds? And you know, when are they getting into rugby? What kind of a, a rugby culture is there in the states at the moment? And like, is it is it a growing sport, or is it still just a, essentially the the guys who kind of aren't really making an American football? They might pick it up in college or something like that. Where are the rugby players in America coming from? Um, well, there's they are starting in high schools now. Um, more often than not, um, there's different pockets around the country where they're little hotbeds for rugby. You'd be surprised. You go to the likes of Seattle, parts of Texas. Um, around California, especially up towards um, Sacramento and stuff like that, um, where rugby is very, very popular and got, kids are getting into it young. When I was in um, Colorado, they have camps for kids and they're out there every Tuesday and Thursday evening throughout the summer, just running around after a ball. And it's, it's great to see, whereas when I came over first in 2012, it was just, as you said, older guys that didn't make it in football still want to hit somebody um so they get together and some patch of grass somewhere and, and hash it out but uh no it's it's definitely growing um it's and as as you said as i said it like it's coming into the schools younger and younger college programs now are are very strong and are hunting talent from from the high schools um our, one of our own, Greg McWilliams, is a uh, head coach, uh, director of rugby at uh, Yale University, and he'll tell you himself that the standard of player that he's getting in there every year is is, is growing and growing. So it's um, the scholarship starting to go for him, and that's what Americans want more than anything else is once they hear scholarship next to a sport, they throw everything into it. Yeah, that's that's definitely a massive thing as well. But unlike guys that might make it in the NFL, are they actually tapping into that market enough? Because it's you know it's this time of the year where over the next couple of weeks there are going to be hundreds and hundreds of guys cut from NFL training rosters, and all of a sudden they're going to be out of a job. And you know here's this sport on the other side where they can be taken in and you know their game refined. Maybe you know the tackle technique changes a little bit, but like you have these these ready tuned athletes to to kind of take advantage of it, like is it worth looking into some of these guys more or do you really have to kind of get them in a bit younger well I mean the, uh, the ones that are successful in rugby have been introduced with even on a, a like a smaller scale in the off season in the football off season they still want to get a little bit of contact or they want the conditioning so they in high school or in college even um, if they're not in, in these big programs um, they they do have some idea of what rugby is which makes it an awful lot easier to convert them um you have the, well even one of our ben landry um who's a second row for the eagles now he he was involved with uh, the seahawks and the packers for a while and he came back to rugby hayden smith at the last world cup so they, they there are guys that are able to go between um there are a, a lot of very talented athletes that if you could introduce them even in a small way, young, and then if they didn't make it, they could definitely make the transition then uh, in, in certain positions. Uh, obviously, ball handling and stuff like that, they're not going to be out halves or anything like that. But They need to learn how to action. tackle as well. They need to, need to learn how to tackle as well. They have a, they have a right. unique way of doing it. Like, I mean, it's just running into players, essentially, is what they're doing. It is. Yeah, I mean, geez, they hit her. Like, in the... In the MLR now, they have a few of these guys that have converted, and bloody hell, when they hit you, it hurts. <laughs> I haven't experienced anything like the way they like. Yes, they, they might probably pick up about ten concussions a season, but 
when they you need to be aware of these kind of guys because they're big guys and they just throw themselves at you. Um, of the Irish guys then as well in the squad, like you're one of you're one of four, Dylan Fawcett, AJ McGinty, uh, who everyone would know very well from his days in Connacht, uh, Paul Mullen, and also Paddy Ryan as well, who you mentioned uh, is a Dolphin club mate of yours. Though he was actually born in the United States, I think, and uh, Chicago, yeah, in Chicago, and then grew up uh, grew up in Cork as well. But uh, like, how fantastic is it to have that kind of core players over there? And I know is it Dylan as well as a teammate of yours in New York as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's brilliant. Um, it is a little bit of a running joke, call us the Irish Mafia. <laughs> um, so, yeah, no, it's it's great to have them lads. And uh, it's just because I haven't been home very much over the last four years. So just to have that piece of Ireland with you, it, like, it's a different type of crack that you'd have with, with other lads. And it's just not to have, um, obviously, Greg McWilliams as well. We... He comes in and out of the mafia, um, but we we need him because he's got high ranking in the team. So, um, but uh, no, it's 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 good. It's good to have these lads, and they're uh, definitely performing. So I'm sure they'll be around for the World Cup. Now your Cork accent doesn't seem to have disappeared too much. Do, 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 does the American uh, Americanism kind of just get ramped up a little bit when you're around all the other lads? It does. I think I have to slow <laughs> so much. My talking down a little bit. My missus takes the piss out of me a bit for it because uh, her accent hasn't gone anywhere. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, definitely around some of the American lads I have to slow down because they have no idea what I'm saying half the time, <laughs> to be honest. They just kind of nod and smoke, I think. Um, but, uh, yeah... On the pitch, just gone, I was going to bring it on, um, Pacific Nations Cup, just finished up, you were over in Fiji, beaten by the eventual winners, Japan, two wins out of three, seemed like it went decent enough, just kind of, just quite weren't up to the level of Japan in the end? Yeah, um, we, we rotated quite a bit as well, so we didn't have quite the cohesion we hoped to have, um, especially coming up against a team like Japan. Um, but yeah, it was it wasn't a bad run out though. We we learned a few things about ourselves and kind of the standard where we need to be at if we're to expect to see some uh, results this World Cup. But uh, two out of three isn't bad. Um, some more a strong team um, and Canada. We put a we put a good score on them. Um, so we're going in the right direction um, and hopefully we can get a couple of guys that are still. Uh, dealing with some injuries um, back into the squad now in the next couple of weeks and uh, have a full team out there for Japan and put in a performance as the, uh, against Canada to put in a performance that'll be the main thing kind of send what, us over then What are the thoughts World Cup wise then I imagine Tonga is the one you're targeting but before you even get to that you have to play in order you have to take on uh, yeah. where is it like England uh, Argentina and then France all before you go up against Tonga so like your best chance of winning a game is coming after the three toughest games you could probably play. Yeah, well, we could see the same thing for them. So, I mean, yeah, pretty pretty much couldn't pick a worse pool. But, <laughs> I mean, it's an opportunity to to do something that hasn't been done for, before by a U.S. team. Um, and we're, that's exciting for us. Um, we've, we've made a few landmarks on our way to this World Cup since the last... Um, and we want to continue to do that. Um, we see uh, some opportunities, albeit small, um, I- I against France, England, Argentina. Um, so we're not going to roll over in those games. We're definitely going to give it everything we have, and we're not going to save anything for that that Tongan game. Um, so yeah, we also have probably the I think it's the longest travel and shortest turnaround. Uh, of any team in the tournament, so we have to deal with that as well, um, which isn't easy. But again, just a just another obstacle where we're looking forward to the challenge of. Mm-hmm. And like it is just an incredibly tough run, England, Argentina, and France. In those particular games, like no one essentially is expecting you to win any of those. And I remember earlier on in this, and I was speaking to um, uh, to Jack Berger when we were discussing Namibia several weeks ago, and he was saying that. When he was going into games, when Namibia were going into games, when everyone's expecting them, you know, against the All Blacks, against Australia World Cups, when everyone expe- is expecting you to be beaten and beaten heavily, do you just kind of have to, to have the mindset of, you know, you go out, you do the things you worked on, you see what happens, and play for yourself as much as anyone else? Yeah, no, absolutely. It, 
it, it's a different challenge than most teams um, are preparing themselves for this World Cup. Um, but, I mean, we had this, it would have been the same chat before the last one. We just didn't do what, what we talked about doing and didn't, didn't have the game plan for it as well. Whereas this time around, we've no excuse. We, we've been prepared properly um, and guys have bought into it. Uh, we have a quality squad, so if we stick to what we do best, um, who knows? Uh, we just have to hang in there. And the thing about games against us is, if we're in it after at half time or just after half time, it puts an awful lot of pressure on those bigger teams to be like, "Hang on here, we're expected to put a huge score here, and we're not doing it right now." So. That's what happened uh, last summer against Scotland, um, and we hope to kind of recreate that a little bit. For those who listen here who might know too much about the US team, like what what are the strengths? I don't want you to give away the state secrets now, and because you know you're going to have to go out and beat England for us. Everyone wants to see that happen, but um, <laughs> like what are the what are the areas of strength for the United States at the moment? Um, well, I can. It, traditionally a very aggressive team uh, we've got some big boys big ball that, carriers big ball that carriers are well big ball carriers um, so yeah that would be traditionally what we're about um, and that, that hasn't changed just with that we're just trying to marry with a bit of structure and um, a decent kicking game so that's that's what we're about it's fairly simple rugby but if we do it well we can we can get some change from it and quick word then after the World Cup, back to Major League Rugby, Rugby United New York. Uh, the uh, Major League Rugby still in its infancy. Is it the first first proper season done and dusted? How has that gone off? What's it been like? What's the how, how has it been received? Uh, very well. Uh, which is the first season for New York. It's the second season for MLR. Um, but uh, it's it's really like even the standard from year one to year two is skyrocketed. Um, teams are already starting to. So I'm some pretty big names uh, just here in New York, uh, Matthew Basso yeah. and Ben Foden and, and guys like that around the country. Um, so it, it is, um, and, and certain teams have really uh, started to get some proper crowds out. Um, so hopefully it can keep growing and it only means good team for, for us as a national team. And is it a fully professional league? Yeah, well, some good. Uh, there's a bunch of I say it, again it, it, from year one to year two the the part timers shrunk and I think it'll continue to shrink in the next few years. But uh, there's a bunch of guys that still work uh, in the city um, and then are training themselves in the gym and, and a couple of nights a week then with us. Um, but the majority I'd say eighteen guys are full time. Um, and the make up uh, squad for uh, part timers. All right, John, we'll leave it there. So the line is starting to drop off again. Thanks a million for speaking to us on Off the Ball, and right. the very best look at the World Cup. Yes, that was USA flanker John Quill speaking us to speaking to us on Land of the Rising Scrum. A reminder, if you want to catch up on any of our previous episodes, you can do so by heading to offtheball.com forward slash podcast or check us out on the Go Loud app. And you can also watch us back on YouTube as well, youtube.com forward slash offtheball. And a reminder, all of our rugby coverage is brought to you by Vodafone, team of us, everyone in. Now, I told you we were doubling up today and we're looking right across the Pacific Ocean now to Fiji, I think everyone's favourite second team team at a Rugby World Cup uh, in Pool D this time around alongside familiar opponents in Australia, Wales and Uruguay, all of whom they faced in 2015 and also Georgia as well. So joining me at the moment to chat about the Fijians, I have former Fiji captain Natani Talai, a veteran of 33 caps and three World Cups. Natani, thanks for joining us. My pleasure, my pleasure, Tom. Um, as I was saying there in the pool stages, feels like deja vu looking at Pool D uh, because you played in 2015. Three of those four opponents lined up to place Fiji again this year, Australia, Wales and uh, Uruguay as well. Yeah, uh, well, it's a tough pool again. Well, I'm, I'm sure everyone's assuming it's the pool of death again. Uh, you know, you have Australia who's top favorite, then you have Wales who's uh, coming in at second favorite. Then apparently you have Georgia who's above Fiji at the moment for some reason. Uh, but, you know, uh, PG is always un unpredictable at stages, so hopefully the boys do, you know, show up uh, during the pool stages. 
As you mentioned there, Fiji, unpredictable, I think is the word you use there. I think it's a fair uh, fair way of describing them because the common theme, as we always get with Fiji, win, lose or draw, is that you're always going to be entertained. You're always going to get that wonderful skill, the huge tackling. Uh, you were more of a power man, I think, than throwing the ball around from what I, from what I would have seen you uh, for you and uh, for the likes of Edinburgh when you were playing in the uh, Pro 12. What is it about the sport of rugby, though, and the Fijian people that just breeds this this love for the game, this love of just running rugby, of throwing the ball around and essentially just going out there, smile on the face and enjoying yourself? I think, it's, you know, it takes us back to the roots from, you know, from childhood. Like, most of these boys, uh, you know, they grew, they, they grew up just by throwing ever whatever they can pick up off the floor. You know, you, you, you're talking, you're not talking about a rugby ball. You're talking about empty cans. You're talking about empty juice bottles. You're talking about coconut, um, you know, old coconut um, that, that's fallen from the tree, you know, and it's, Whatever they can play with makes them happy. And this is where the offloading comes in, you know. Uh, boys just love to throw the ball in any direction they can, you know, overhead, under the, you know, under the legs. Um, but, you know, I think that's what people want to watch is the offloading and the women rugby. But with the modern rugby, you know, they have to take into con- uh, consideration as well, you know, the breakdown, the scrums, the line-outs is an effective way of playing rugby nowadays. So hopefully, you know, the boys implement that into their game rather than just trying to run teams down for 80 minutes which doesn't really happen nowadays because like nowadays all teams are you know, they're, they're up for 80 minutes for rugby especially like running rugby in a, in a completely hypothetical situation if, if Fiji after a World Cup or coming into this World Cup were to, to get a new head coach and he decided that he was going to throw the playbook out of the window and all this running rugby would stop and the carefree attitude and it was going to be a, a real strict game plan a lot of discipline to us um, how do you think, you know, and, and we'll say the results came with it, if they started to win consistently, how do you think that would be received in Fiji? Would they kind of, are they happier to just kind of enjoy the game and make it a spectacle without actually winning? Or, you know, if they were actually winning games, would they be happy if they were doing it in a boring way? Uh, to a certain extent, to be honest, I think back at home, you know, uh, and fans are, are passionate about just rugby itself, um, and most most people back at home don't just Fiji. They support other nations as well because you know they have families living abroad as well. So with Fiji winning, no matter how ever they win, even if it's by three points, it is still a win for everyone at home, and everyone celebrates because it's a win. Um, as much as they want to watch Fiji play, the flair, the speed, the offloading. End of the day, Fijians want to see a win, uh, no matter how it's done, you know, through a conversion or a, a drop goal. Uh, you know, they just want to see, it puts a smile across their faces just for a small island nation winning the game. And especially like if, if they are able to topple the two big teams like Wales and Australia. Tell me about um, about growing up in Fiji and kind of the role the, the rugby plays in your country. Because as you were saying there, you know, kids in Fiji, they're picking up whatever they can play with, uh, you know, whether it's a coconut or a water bottle or a, an empty can of a can of Coca-Cola or something like that. But, um, you know, when you are doing that, you know, when you're playing as a young kid, is like, are there any other sports that are being played to a great extent in Fiji? Rugby is the one we all associate with the country. Uh, not really, because, you know, you have um, tennis, you have uh, a soccer, which is football as well, mm. but you know most most kids nowadays just gradually convert into into rugby, no matter what age, what race, you know, because it's a it's a big sport at the moment because World Cup is a hype at the moment. Um, growing up, you know, is yeah, you know, for for instance, myself, I grew up as a as a middle distance runner rather than a rugby player because you know it, I was just brought into that uh, that sport. But because all my mates played rugby, I kind of like wanted to be involved, I wanted to be accepted into rugby, so I had to choose rugby over running. Um, so it's just, a, it's just a normal thing for a kid coming to you know, the islands, just picking up a rugby ball, playing rugby, rather than any other sport, because you know, there's, we don't have the facilities for any other sport, except swimming, but you know, an open field. You find a small pa- pa- patch of land, you'll see kids playing rugby there, because mm. all they need is whatever they can get their hands on, a can of Coke, a bottle to play, because we don't have the facilities, really. 
How far do you think Fiji could go if they actually did have the facilities, if they were to be helped out by, you know, World Rugby, and not just Fiji as well, we're talking Tonga, and, you know, I spoke to a friend of yours, Dan Leo, as well, when we were talking about Samoa, and how the likes of Fiji, Tonga, and Samoa tend to be left behind a lot. Like, how far could these countries go if they were given the right structures in place and helped along the way a little bit more? You know, massively. It will make a massive difference, to be honest. Um, You know, similar to, like, 2006, there was a massive funding from the World Rugby, which, you know, the team didn't see any single penny, to be honest. Uh, Don't know where the money disappeared, but I think invested $4 into the country, into some more Fijian Tonga to set up high performance, uh, try to set up academies, which didn't last long, really, because, you know, no one knew... Where, how the budget was used, where the money went. Um, players were still getting paid the basic salary living in the islands, you know, which is minimum wage, really. Um, but the boys were just doing it because they were passionate about it. Um, you know, if they had a good structure behind it and people behind it to organize and, and look that the money is being shared out between the union and the players and the infrastructure to develop these players from grassroots level... It would make massive difference, to be honest. Um, I think two days ago, Fiji just, you know, accepted a massive, uh, I think it was two million Fijian dollars for the World Cup prep, which I think personally is way too late. Like they have you know, 28 days for the World Cup. Mm. You know, Fiji would have benefited with that last year for development purposes. But now, 28 days into that, it would not actually change. It doesn't really matter, really, because it's a bit too late to start investing into the team now um you know i think it should be a, a different structure i think there should be probably a two three years uh, development stages from grassroots coming in and a proper infrastructure to a governing body to see where the money is spent really how it's spent and if it's focused on development and the, and the players itself when you consider like those things you're saying there and just how little money there is in rugby in fiji um is it, is it hardly a surprise then when you see the amount of like Fijian-born players playing for other countries in the world? Like only during the night, Australia named their squad for the, the World Cup and the 31-man uh, squad. Three, uh, three Fijian-born players in it were likely to have two Fijian-born players in the French squad. Uh, Sebu is someone notably uh, who has come through in New Zealand in the last year or so, Fijian-born as well. Um, you know... When these is it is it disappointing to see these kind of players playing for other nations, or is there an element of pride where you see where you know your fellow countrymen have kind of gone and have you know are representing Fiji all around the world? Oh, to to be honest, back in the days it would be like a massive disappointment because you know they see a Fijian captain the All Blacks or the Wallabies or thing. But like you, when when you've come through the system and you see how badly Fijian players are being treated by the union. Oh you realize that you have respect for these players who's gone, who's channeled their, their channeled talent into different places like the All Blacks, the Australians, because of their lifestyle, their welfare, their livelihood, because at the end of the day, they are governed by a good union, you know, and they have, you know, they've just, people might say they're poaching players. I'd say, you know, it's just local players wanting to earn a better lifestyle and a better living by playing for bigger nations. So I look at that as a, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, it, it gives me pride to see those boys excelling in those bigger teams, to be fair. Mm-hmm. Uh, looking back in your own days on the pitch, uh, three World Cups you played in 2007, 11 and 15. 2007, though, obviously the highlight, uh, that was when you beat Wales and qualified for the quarterfinals. Um, it, like an incredible achievement for Fiji. I know you were unlucky enough to have got injured uh, earlier in the tournament and missed out on that Wales match but like looking back at it now just an incredible achievement for Fiji to get to the quarterfinals at that stage yeah 100% like you know it, it goes back to the development like um, you know the World Rugby sent in uh, who was our coach in 2006 so you had who is scholars now with the newly appointed Welsh coach you know uh, you know you had Peter Murphy who is our um, head, uh, high performance uh, manager. Then you had, you know, Vince Kelly, who was our strength and conditioning coach. Um, so these guys set a platform for 2007 because, you know, they were top top qualified coaches who came in and just changed the whole dynamics of how Fijian players should play. 
you know, and brought in fitness uh, fitness tests where if you don't, no matter what, you know, however talented you are, if you don't pass the fitness test or come in overweight the next day, you don't train to the squad, you know, and they put in a, a disciplinary action. So all these pandemics kind of like changed how we performed in 2007, you know, when Quebec and them got, up, unfortunately, you know, with their circumstances, they didn't manage to push 2007. So everyone that came through that that um, development actually excelled in 2007, um, you know, similar to what Ben Ryan did with the Fiji 7th boys. Um, you know, and it, it, it is what it is. So when Quebec and them came in and set a platform for two years prior to 2007, and all the were playing 2007 were top quality performers because of what they did two years previous to that. And looking through that team when it was this morning, like it is just tragic to, to look at that and think that three of the players from the 2007 squad are no longer with us. Uh, Maleli Kudavora and uh, John Ralomo, and of course then one of the all-time great Fijians, Semi uh, Rabini, uh, Sarah Rabini passing away at the age of 37. Like just incredible to think that of that team just 12 years ago, uh, three players tragically have lost their lives. Yeah, you know, it is said to see, um, you know, those players, you know, they were really good friends of mine, especially uh, uh, Chone and um, Kunovori, who I grew up with, you know. Um, and then, unfortunately, Sarah Rambeni followed, um, you know, um, you know, may they go bless their families and, and everything else. But, um, yeah, you know, it is the backlash of everything, you know, the stress that rugby has behind Everything else, you know, away from your families, um, you know, you you you're in a new, you're in a foreign country, and then you know you get isolated. You don't get the support that you need or that you want, um, and then you just you know get misled by, you know, the, the the things that this this world has to offer, like alcohol and, and, and you know depression starts to kick in and all these things. So, um, you know, but you know we cannot we cannot ch- change what's happened, but we can actually help other players coming through the system now and just trying to, you know, protect them from all these um, future events, um, uh, you know, me- uh, mental, um, mental awareness and, and, you know, depression. So, um, and, and that was one of the main things, you know, some of those players faced then. So I think, you know, it's just, like I said, setting a structure for, for future players coming through and it starts with the union of, I think we've, uh, have we lost you there, uh, Natana? I'm, I'm, I'm still here. I'm still oh, here. sorry, no problem. Um, we're just uh, just about running out of time. I might just quickly ask you, though, like, in terms of Fiji for this World Cup, tough pool, we've uh, spoken about it already, is a reasonable outcome, wins against Uruguay and Georgia, and strong showings against Wales and, uh, and Australia? Uh, yeah, you know what, like I said, like, it, it, it is a... It, it is apparently the pull of death. Like, you know, you cannot um, you cannot cut, uh, cut Georgia out of it. You cannot cut Fiji out of it. As you know, as much as people are predicting Wales and Australia going through, um, you know, anything can happen, and and everyone has to be on the top of the game in order to go through the the later stages, really. So, you know, I'm just you know, as much as I'm Fijian, I hope for the best for them. But you know, you have Georgia who's who could have an upset as well. You you know, Uruguay could do an upset as well. Um, you know, saying that like 2015 um, Japan, South Africa. So anything could happen. Like um, I think we just have to yeah, and and just play consistently, consistency, consistently for the whole 80 minutes. Okay, Natalia Talai, thanks a million for joining us on Land of the Rising Scrum and enjoy Bye the World Cup. Much.